All right, welcome, welcome everybody. I guess we might get started. Um, so I have just put a link to the Miro board that we're going to be using for the discussions today in the chat if you weren't able to receive it via email before the meeting. And just to let you know that we are recording this meeting in case people are unable to uh, attend, um, just so that they uh, can also contribute. Um, so the Miro board will be left open after the meeting so that you can contribute to um, we continue to contribute after the meeting is finished. So my name is Sue Kay and I'm the Research Director for Cyber Physical Systems with CSIRO's Data61 and was one of the principal architects of the first robotics roadmap for Australia. And I'd like to introduce Kent Stewart, who is undergoing the same process for New Zealand, putting a roadmap together. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Sorry, I arrived a little bit late. So I'm not sure in New Zealand, Kent, but um, in Australia, we uh, usually start a meeting by uh, paying our respects to the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all meeting and uh, yeah, just paying our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I don't know whether you have a similar tradition in New Zealand. Uh, not that I'm aware of. Uh, we, we, we will... So, um, Sometimes, sorry, Ian Woodhead here, um, <laughs> colleague as well. We will sometimes um, say uh, karakia and a kind of a Māori introduction, but it's a little bit of a process where we're happy to go along with what your process is uh, this time. Yeah. Okay, so uh, did you want to give any more introduction, Kent, or should we head straight into the introduction to the mirror board? Uh, I had a few quick slides just to recap on um, the summary of my findings so far, if I could quickly share those with the group. Great. Um, sorry, just one second. Is everyone able to see my screen now? Yes. Sure. Okay, cool. So hopefully in preparation, you've all reviewed the YouTube clip. However, I have a few quick slides just to recap on the important findings so far. Um, if you could put it in presentation mode, um, it would be a little bit larger on everyone's screens, Ken. Oh, sorry. Is it, uh, I think it's already, it's, it's already full. Sorry, I'm having some technical difficulties. Very sorry, having some technical difficulties here. Um, if I could maybe just quick quickly go through the slides in PowerPoint form. I know it's not ideal, but at least quickly get the content across. Yep. Um, so essentially, uh, yeah, thank you all for attending. Uh, first of all, I just want to recap on kind of the motivation for improving robotics in New Zealand. Uh, firstly, um, as you're probably aware that the labour productivity in New Zealand is 20% below the OECD average. And as many studies have shown, uh, robotics and automation can actually improve the labour productivity by 20 to 30%. Um, and based on my current findings, 
uh, about 70% of New Zealand's industry or New Zealand's GDP can be improved through the adoption of robotics and automation. And so overall, many areas are generally under, underdeveloped in New Zealand. The major sectors in New Zealand, based on my current findings, are manufacturing, largely driven by the automation of food and beverage processing, um, followed by services and agriculture, which is also driven by package sorting and UAV services and farm automation. So that's the industry. And in terms of research capability, um, based on a survey of 117 robotics researchers in New Zealand that I've identified, um, health and agriculture are uh, our largest application areas, um, which fits our fundamental research areas of field of robotics and human centered robotics quite well. Yeah, so that was just a quick recap to make sure everyone's up to speed. And so then we can go forward with this workshop. Thank you. Thanks, Kent. And it might be great if we could, um, uh, if you don't mind sharing that survey, maybe we could do that in Australia as well and just see how, how we compare. Yeah, sure. I'll be happy to. Now, Andrew, um, would you be available to give us a quick update on Miro before we all head over to the boards? Sure, and thank you, Kent, for uh, stepping in and, and sort of going through that because I was a little bit late, so it gave me a chance to uh, get set up. So thank you so much. So um, I, would, I might share my screen if that's okay, Sue. Yeah, thanks, Andrew. And look, I didn't give you a very good introduction. Andrew is, as well as running his own business, Symbiotic Innovations, is also uh, starting the Queensland Robotics Cluster. Sorry, I'm just trying to share my screen. Why won't you share? <laughs> oh, of course, everything has gone into, uh, we need to update your settings. Also, if people don't have the link to the Miro board, it's in the chat for the Webex meeting. So it looks like everybody's on there, so um, which is great. So what I might do is I might just talk through it instead of sharing my screen. Um, so uh, for those of you who have not used Miro, uh, it's a collaboration board. Think of it like a, a bit of a whiteboard with the opportunity to put sticky notes and, and other um, interesting things like that. So it's a it's an opportunity to, to really uh, sort of uh, uh, collaborate. Um, on the left hand side is a toolbar, uh, starting with a sort of a, a pointer. Um, and as you go down, it's like the uh, fourth icon down, it's your sticky notes. And that's where you can click on that, uh, click your favorite color of sticky note. Once you've grabbed a, a sticky note, you can place it on the board, you can change its size, you can change its color, um, even change its shape. Uh, one thing to note is uh, a, 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 it will remember uh, what you used last time. So all you have to do is double click on the board again uh, and it will uh, create another sticky note. Um, the other point to, to note, some people, um, I know Sue's uh, experienced this with lots of people on the board. If you find all the guest names a little um, uh, disconcerting, you can actually turn that off. So along the top strip, you will see some icons uh, of faces um, and next to that is a, a, um, a pointer and it's basically the hide collaborator cursor. Uh, so you can turn that on and off. Personally, I like it, but uh, some people uh, may not like it. Now, in terms of the, the makeup of the boards, what we've tried to do is we've got a bit of a SWOT, which I think uh, everybody's, uh, looks like everybody's uh, um, uh, sort of hanging around at the moment. Um, and what we've uh, we've done purposely is to have uh, essentially the strengths and weaknesses under each country as a way of sort of capturing some of the key strengths and weaknesses of each country. And then there's opportunities and threats. And think of that as opportunities and threats that we can do combined. Um, and then there's uh, some additional uh, squares where there's the intersection. So the intersections are, you know, what are strategies that we can make use of the opportunities through our strengths? Uh, or threats, uh, prevent our threats uh, through our strengths, um, or make use of our opportunities to um, minimize our weaknesses and so forth. So if there's any ideas um, that you have around that, that's where you place them. 
Uh, we also have a um, uh, important uh, difficulty chart. And so this is just, uh, you know, trying to highlight some opportunities, collaboration of opportunities um, uh, in terms of difficulty and importance. Uh, and so you can go ahead and there's actually a collection of sticky notes next to that chart that you can just grab and, and sort of place on the board just for convenience. Um, with regards to the, uh, the technology, um, uh, what we've renamed technology collaboration roadmap. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, certain technologies that, um, that, that we have and, and Kent has already highlighted some of the, the analysis that, uh, that you guys have done in New Zealand uh, with regards to what are some of the, the areas of expertise um, and specializations that, uh, that make, uh, you might have a um, competitive edge over the rest of the world. Um, this technology collaboration roadmap is trying to capture between now and, and what we see in the future, uh, what are some technologies that we could work together uh, and collaborate on um, and where we can do so that is unique uh, and has a competitive edge on the global stage. So whether it's taking advantage of our, our geographies, taking advantage of, um, of some of the common uh, you know, um, uh, aspects, research aspects, other collaborations that we've got uh, between the two countries. Um, the last point, and, and I'll, I guess, uh, Ken, you put the, the bottom board, and this was really just to, uh, to try and uh, capture you know, what are some of the good um, examples of multinational robotics collaboration um, networks that we've already got underway? And, and I'll just add that we had a wonderful uh, uh, talk uh, from Rocos from New Zealand at our um, uh, Queensland Robotics Cluster Muster on Friday. Uh, and the response to that was, uh, was amazing. It was actually really good. So, you know, there's already examples of those types of things where we're, we're um, giving uh, each other opportunities um to uh, to collaborate um but also i think there's there's other opportunities or other projects that we've got underway um and so there's a, a, a orange box down the bottom uh, where we can capture uh, looks like kent has already put one um, with regards to uk denmark and spain the robot net uh any questions at this stage or is there anything you want to add kent no thank you very much for the great introduction to the mirror board yeah, so, how, so I'm going to ask a very naive question. How do you there actually, is no naive question, so go ahead. How do you actually get onto Mario? Because I've downloaded the app, I've looked, at, and I can't see how to link the, the app to the actual meeting. So uh, all you need to, so it's, you, you, uh, you interact with the app outside of the meeting itself. So you, uh, you, you basically open up a, a web page um, and follow the link that Sue, I think, uh, has shared in the, the chat. Um, okay. Well, I'm not. Unfortunately, I'm not used to Cisco WebEx meetings, so. So just so just bring up a, a web browser um, yep. and uh, copy that that link. Um, okay. That, gotcha. Uh, that Sue um, shared. Um, when it should say because we we basically made it for public um, uh, editing. Uh, yep. What that means is that you don't need to have an account. So there will be a banner across the top that will be encouraging you to sign up. You don't have to sign up. Uh, you can go ahead and and uh, uh, and edit away. Cool, that's brilliant. I should be able to figure it now. Thank you. Uh, and I also just wanted to iterate. There is no wrong um, way of doing things. Um, you can you know um, just go ahead. We've tried to lock down any objects, so you shouldn't have to um, worry about uh, accidentally moving things. Um, so yeah. So back to you, Sue. All right. Thanks, Andrew. And uh, so I think that the idea was that we were going to start with strengths and weaknesses. And you can see there's one board for each country. So it'll be interesting to see whether we come up with any differences. Uh, and we're going to do that for about 10 minutes before, I guess, coming back to discuss the similarities and differences. And then we will start moving on to other parts of the Miro board. So, um, so yep, go ahead, Andrew. So, so, and probably one uh, comment to make around a you know, united strength. And I, I think this is probably uh, one of those comments that's fairly obvious, but I think it's still um, worth stating. And, and I'm not sure if you actually um, stated it in your introduction, Sue, before. So apologies if you have. But, uh, you know, I see a perspective, especially with, and, and you've probably had similar conversations with colleagues overseas, um, is that there's, an opportunity, I think, between uh, Australia and New Zealand, where 
we we're coming out of this crisis way ahead of everybody else uh, even though there are you know still some we're still early days and and we've got our wonderful friends in victoria um that are busily trying to get uh, the situation under control down there but uh, on the grand scheme of things we are definitely in a much better position than anywhere else in the world um, and the rest of the world are very jealous of that but that also gives us i think a really unique opportunity uh, the other piece to, to think about is the shift in confidence in the marketplace um, and so that's another opportunity that i think we can um, we can potentially seize uh, an opportunity there to carve out a um, based on the confidence of how we've reacted to the the um, uh, the, the crisis um, and but also how we've actually um, we've been active in trying to lift our capability uh, and take advantage of, of our opportunities and, and uh, in skill, uh, I guess, resident uh, capacity, cap capability and skill sets. So I'm not sure if uh, anybody else wants to comment on that, but uh, that's definitely something that I'm, I'm seeing. I think it's important when we're uh, looking at the strengths and weaknesses that we kind of consider both specific like applications of robotics, but also uh, general areas in terms of developing the robotic systems in each of our countries. Yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, because there may be situations that you know may not be an obvious um, uh, capability, but um, working together combined, uh, we could actually turn it into something significant. Well, it's a very interesting comment that uh, New Zealand Civil Aviation Authority is open to uh, long range drones, um, whereas in Australia, that's just not something that's on the radar. That's a, that's a great one. Uh, it's, it's not quite true that it's not on the radar. I mean, there's the Jarus process in Australia as well, and there are a number of beyond visual line of sight projects already flying in Australia. Um, they, the, the, there are, but um, most of those have spotters along the route, um, and the hurdle to get there is, is is very high. We're involved in some of those. Yeah, I'm. I'm involved in one at the moment where we're just doing the application for EVLS long range drones for for bushfires and yeah. it's um th there is a process I mean we haven't got to the end of the process but um there's some that are flying that started off with spotters and moved to not having spotters after CASA gained sufficient confidence in them yeah so, but I, I'm not familiar with the New Zealand model at all to know how different it is does it use Jarus as well <laughs> Sorry, Richard Green, are you here? <laughs> he would be the person to ask. Sorry, I do not know. I can get back to you on that one. I'll fill, fill it in. Oh, that, that would be a big draw card. I mean, for a lot of Australian companies, if there was a, an area in New Zealand you could go and test and fly. Um. Yeah, having actually a, a, a site as opposed to a process. Um, and uh, yeah, that would be, that would certainly be very nice. Uh, there, there isn't really a, a good UAS test site that anyone can use in, a, in Australia. I presume that's also lacking in New Zealand. Is that right? Um, well, based on, there was a, a company in the US, uh, WISC, that came over with their um, self-driving uh, taxi. Um, and I believe they've been working quite closely with the CAA in terms of developing the regulations around uh, 
creating a self-driving taxi within New Zealand's air airspace. So I believe there is a lot of like flexibility in New Zealand's regulations around that, which is why a lot of companies come to New Zealand to test those sorts of te technology. Andrew, my understanding was that uh, one of the big differences between how Australia and New Zealand uh, looks at drone operations is in the way that um, the different countries define risk. In that in Australia, it's much more, um, you know, you have to be a certain number, of, have people a certain number of metres distant or, um, you know, that it's actually very, uh, I don't know whether quantitative is the right word, but that in New Zealand, it's more, um, common sense for want of a bit better word it's it's about assessing whether you can do something safely as opposed to whether you can do something at a particular number of meters away yeah i'm not sure sue um Sorry, I, know... I, was thinking, I was talking thinking andrew tridgel oh good okay <laughs> Sorry. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is it is very much sort of you know, in Australia, you know, number of metres, the whole 30 metre rule and, and it, you know, can even apply to, you know, indoor things, even if they've got walls and things. So some of that I, I do think is pretty silly in Australia. Um, I, I just don't have any experience within what it would be like in New Zealand. Um, I also know that many of those rules are, you know, widely flouted in Australia. Um, you even see videos on CASA's own website, Facebook page, yeah. and the things yeah. which violate their own rules. Uh, which so <laughs> and, yeah. and the highest fine that CAS has applied to someone is about a third of the cost of actually uh, being legal. I think it was uh, seven thousand dollar fine for someone that hit someone with a drone at the end of that marathon, and the minimum cost to um, sort of get to an IOC stage is about twenty grand. <sighs> Yeah, I think all that's actually quite dated information. I mean, that doesn't have a lot of several years ago now. Um, the whole regulatory and certification process has advanced quite a lot um, for one side and for another side drones. So I think we need to be careful that we do, if we're going to identify these things as strengths and weaknesses, that we're using contemporary regulations rather than you know, artifacts of history to write that, that don't really happen. Um, the JARS process that Trinity is referring to there is an evolution of what CAS has been doing in the past and does align with um, Australia, with, particularly with Europe, um, in, in the application of, of regulation. Your, your audio, James, is, is absolutely awful. Right, I'm not talking. I, I think you have to change microphone, sorry. Everyone else getting the core audio? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, it was. It was. I think James's point was that we need to make sure that we're actually referring to the most up-to-date information. And so yeah. I guess it would be good to get some, you know, maybe we could actually just directly ask CASA and I'm not sure what the New Zealand equivalent is um, uh, to cross-check yeah. some of that. Yeah, 20K surprises me for, to get a REOC. That's, uh, it depends what sort of REOC. I mean, if you're, you know, doing, well, trying to do a Google delivery us. drone, then it's probably 100K, but yeah. if it's, yeah, we, we've had ours for about four years, and that's um, what it basically costs. Well, to get the REOC and then license our pilots. Um, yeah, typical course, REPL course, are like three or 4,000 per pilot. Uh, so if you've got a, a few pilots and you're trying to get the REOC as well. Yeah, I, um, I guess my point is, yeah, it's, um, you know, as someone, you know, who values their... Um, REOC and you know follows the rules you're much more restricted than someone that doesn't actually have a REOC in some ways um, so Andrew Tridgell this is the actual the Tridge <laughs> uh, I'm commonly known as Tridge yep what a great honour it is to be on a uh, a call with you. Oh, <laughs> not really. And J James just pointed me at this. It seemed like a good idea to to jump in and say hello. Um, um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Tridge has been um, 
uh, instrumental in the development of uh, the RG Pilot code. And, um, uh, you know, his, his name is usually on my screen at least once a month when I'm looking stuff up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Hopefully not next to a crash report. No, 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 no. <laughs> Well, there's plenty of activity going on. Um, Kent, I don't know whether you're keeping an eye on it, but um, we were going to move on at 12 um, to have a look at opportunities and threats. Um, has anybody been actually having a bit of a look at what's, uh, what the differences are between the New Zealand um, uh, identified strengths and weaknesses and the Australian ones are and would like to comment? Uh, just one observation. I think um, you know there's uh, some differences around, but I don't think they're differences. They're just um, it seems to be coming out on the board. So I think we've still got we've got the similar issues. Uh, some of the weaknesses on the New Zealand side is on the funds. I think we've got similar uh, issues, um, but uh, it doesn't come out on some of the, the comments. Um, one that I think I like the uh, and the matching. Um, one weakness is the scale, um, whether or not it's, uh, it's attributed, but we do have large wide open spaces. So we have the opportunity of scaling test areas um, uh, and there's a potential for working together to scale capability. So I think there's a good match between a weakness and a, and a strength. Yeah. Yeah, also, as you probably all know, there's well, field robotics seems to be strong in both areas, and I don't know how strong the horticulture and agriculture sector is in Australia, but or in terms of robotics and automation usage, um, but in New Zealand, it's definitely an area that's developing a lot recently with the new agritech sector growing. Yeah, no, that's a good one. And I would definitely agree with that. And my observation is that I, I see the, the New Zealand uh, applications really focused on the strength of the economy. Um, and, mm -hmm. and it's not the case in Australia. Australia is more broad and where we can apply robotics and automation. So that is the difference that I can see in those uh, strengths and weaknesses. Oh, here's a quick key question to, that follows on from that uh, comment um, is, would you say, and this is a struggle that we've got, and we've got a you know active program to try and change the, the narrative uh, at a government level, um, but in New Zealand, is there definite support at a, at a national level? for robotics programs um, uh, across the board, uh, or is it still um, needs further development? Like for example, and I'll be you know, a, you know, fairly coarse, um, does your prime minister, can she spell the word robotic and she is willing to spell uh, to say it in public? Because um, our prime minister definitely, I think um, is, the, uh, is the opposite. Um, I don't think he, he knows the word, to be honest, or wants to know the word uh, is probably the, the, the true piece. Um, I can try and answer that. It's Simon Yeri from Callahan Innovation. So we've had New Zealand government. Um, I don't know if just someone else knows if she can, um, but I tested her on that recently. Um, so what I'd say is, um, yeah, we do have some good government support. So um, certainly in, in, in specific verticals. So um, around uh, Agritech, someone's already talked about that. We have a lot of support um, from the government specifically to try and develop that further. And um, uh, yeah, I'm part of that um, process. Um, we have another uh, other sort of initiatives around um, robotics and automation. For example, Industry 4.0, which you guys are probably all aware of, is, is where that um, through Callahan Innovation and others is, is um, you know, supporting. Uh, it'd also be fair to say, though, we don't have as the, and I think New Zealand Raz, who's, who's here today, um, Ken, um, would probably agree that 
the sort of the roadmap that you guys have got um, across your, um, you know, the Australian Robotics Network is something we're still aspiring to, if I, if I can say that, and we're working towards that. So as you probably know, Ken is currently working on that. So um, we're not where we want to be yet, but we've we've got from Excellent. For example, which is but also at the same time, you have the national challenges in New Zealand that really direct a lot the industry investment towards specific areas of national relevance. Um, yeah, that's right. And one of, one of them is, um, carry on. No, yeah, that, uh, and of course, we know each other, Bruce, from, it's good to see you again, from from the work with the, with the national challenges. Yeah, yeah, you too. Um, yeah, there's a theme for robotics, automation and sensing in, in the technology challenge, which Paolo knows all about. And uh, that's, that's the, probably the key national level um, officially. Um, they've also funded quite a few projects around that, that area over time. So. From an outside perspective, um, looking at the strengths and weaknesses on the board, um, it, it does seem that Australia, that New Zealand, and and going off Paolo's comment, uh, your innovation ecosystem might be a bit better connected than in Australia. Although I know one of the weaknesses is the innovation landscape in New Zealand is difficult to navigate. Um, but is that so? Is that real or perceived? Uh, and I don't know whether other people would agree with me that Australia's innovation ecosystem is pretty fragmented. How are you going? Good. How are you? Oh, I just I maybe on the call still. So. Uh, so I don't think Andrew was answering that question. <laughs> <laughs> so innovation ecosystem. Anyone want to jump in? Yeah, I think there is a, a competition for, for resources in Australia. Um, so Australian universities in general do not collaborate at the level you would see uh, in other places like in New Zealand. So this is one observation that I can I can share. It happens, but it's not common. So there is more competition for uh, research dollars than you would see otherwise. So that is a key point. Thanks, Paolo. The New Zealand system tends to be more collaborative across universities, across CRIs, across government. They do seem to be more open to talking about what the needs are and identifying needs. And as Bruce has alluded to, the science for technology innovation has really made a difference to robotics and the spearheads and the seed projects that are coming out of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I think um, Ian here. So I think that's been a change in uh, over the last few years because we were quite insular from an organisational point of view some years ago, and that was kind of driven by the quite competitive science funding model. But under, uh, I guess, directives from that um, uh, funding organisation um, and an encouragement for collaboration, and also especially through the National Science Challenges and for Science for Technological Innovation, which is one of uh, 11 of the National Science Challenges, that collaboration has been encouraged and pushed along. And I, th I think it's been successful from, from both uh, regards in terms of uh, more collaborative models. So I think we've, we're heading towards more where we mm. want to get to. Um, this, there's still uh, quite a strong element of competition, so it's a bit of a mixed model in some respects. Yeah, I think, quite, uh, I think some of that has spilled over into other areas. So in the uh, large government funded projects funded by MB, there's more team building and more, you know, collaboration across organisations than there used to be in the past. That's Ian said in the last few years, you know, there's a noticeably more board discussing and collaborating. Um, so hopefully that's kind of changing slowly, but yeah, there's still that competitive aspect, of course. Yeah. From what I see as well, we see the, the this multimedia enterprise sector and the economy really linked with with researchers in a completely different level in New Zealand, really better integrated 
uh, and naturally happening than forced in a given scheme. So it is, it is really nice to see that, plus the culture with the vision Maltaranga as well, uh, as part of the, the national challenge. Sorry, Sorry. Uh, just to um, explain to it, I mean, assuming that uh, this current government is successful with the upcoming election, you're going to see more of these industry transformation plans. So the Agritech one that I referred to that does have a quite a focus on, on automation within it as a, as a possible mechanism to transform the, the agri-tech sector. Um, you're going to see more and more opportunities for this in the other sectors. And I'll just encourage you know everyone on this call to tap into that. Um, there's going to be a digital one, a food and beverage one, a forestry one. And in each of those, you know, automation, sensing, et cetera, has a really important part to play. And, and if that can be you know, incorporated into those plans, it's going to be more likely that it's going to provide opportunities for researchers going forward. And, and the second point I'd make is we're really, really keen on trans-Tasman, um, and that's why I'm on this call, um, you know, relationships, we see the benefit for both parties. So maybe in the past where, you know, perhaps we were, you know, big brother and little brother and a bit competitive, um, we, we see that, you know, our place in the world, I think whoever referred to it, even point of view is, is quite similar and that companies and investors, international companies and investors tend to look at us as a, as a you know, collective. So the more we can work together and build each other's capability, um, that certainly resonates with, that, with the current government here in New Zealand. All right, thank you. I think we need to move over into the opportunities threats and this is not divided by country. See, we're already operating more collaboratively as the webinar moves on. So if you could start um, putting some thoughts as to what the opportunities and threats are, um, that'd be great. Just, just a quick one for New Zealand. I noticed the mining industry is not really um, popping up in any of these um, sectors. Is, is there a sizable mining industry there that um, is interested in automation and digitization? No. So we've got the, we've got the greens and power sharing power. Uh, and also, in all seriousness, we had the most awful um, Pike River tragedy a couple of years yeah. ago. So yeah. mining is, is a dirty word to hear. Yeah. 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 Mind you, you do have a couple of suppliers that, that supply internationally. So um, uh, Sequent uh, are a New Zealand company that now have uh, a, a huge market share um of uh, of the mining services uh, world more on the geology side uh, based yeah. out of christchurch um there's a few others um that are there so you may not have the mining itself but you've actually got some capability on mining services yeah but although compared to australia our industry has always been trivial small yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and we tend to dig tunnels rather than pits. <laughs> <laughs> I know Australia's pretty good at digging tunnels around their cities and things. <laughs> Richard, do you mind just quickly commenting on the testing and flying of drones in New Zealand? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, um, this will be a surprise to everyone from NZRAS not, <laughs> but I consider drones robots because we're attaching tools to them and basically working using the drone is like, think of it as this end of a robot arm, so essentially a six degree freedom um, effector. And we're doing the same with underwater drones as well. Um, so we made a whole lot of progress there, like drones pruning trees and other things. So um, and now we're looking at drones getting to you know, with a millimetre hover of precision to actually use tools more effectively and um, and similar things under underwater. So, uh, yeah, so we've actually made a whole lot of progress there and are continuing that research effort. So uh, I confess that I do bring this up a lot, you know, that I consider drones are now robots. And Richard, what about the navigation rules? And do we, you, use Jarus, is it? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we're slightly more relaxed than Australia, um, but we've still got fairly strict rules, although we do have some really good um, areas that have been set aside by the government for our usage, like one near Christchurch and one up north of Auckland, uh, where we can do 
break all the rules, you know, fly beyond line of sight, automated, more than one drone per person, you know, every rule you can imagine we can break. So um, that's been very useful for uh, research, advancing our research and testing drones. Sorry, Richard, is that autonomously or are they? Sorry, controlled? autonomously, yes. I forgot to say, sorry, all our work is based on autonomous operation, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and these areas large and designated as areas for testing drones? Yes. Okay. Hmm. Are they available? Is there a, a, an interest from overseas? Are people yes. coming, bringing their drones to test in those yep. areas? Yes, and that's already happened. Yes. Right. On. Who who regulates that? Uh, we've got CAA, that's our, um, that's the uh, government authority that sets the regulations yep. and we've got airways which are like um, the police that, um, you know, police those regulations. Yeah, right. Well, that's interesting. Um, I, I think the other common thing is like New Zealand's surrounded by water and down in the Southern Ocean, Australia's surrounded by um, water and, um, you yeah, know, that's a common application for drones we have is coastal surveillance and search and rescue. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Yeah. And that's a real strength between us um, and, and an area for, for development. It, it is. And it's because it's such last, vast areas and humans get fatigued very quickly looking at screens and so on. It's an area where there's been a lot of progress in deep learning, picking up things that a human would miss. Exactly. Uh, very high resolution images over long periods of time. Yeah. But particularly with AI now, and, you yeah. know, it could be a real area of common common interest because I mean you've only got a Google um, search abandoned due to conditions and yes. as soon as yeah. someone goes off a boat yeah um, they've got a couple of hours and yeah my argument would be in that situation um, you get all aircraft manned aircraft out of the area and send the drones in yeah uh, yes. great and that could be something that between the two countries if there's an interest potential um, we could involve the government because yeah. it is a very strong area of mutual interest. Yeah, I, I agree. Hey, it's nice to hear someone else talking about drones in a discussion about robots. Oh, look, we're a robotics company. We build <laughs> robots for mining and we build drones for various applications. Oh, that's great. Good. And, and I think, you know, the proliferation of AI now, where you can just simply throw a Raspberry Pi and a coral on a, a small uh, drone and you've got better eyes than a human being. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. We've got we've got full frame rate with a deep learning network on a Raspberry Pi. So yeah, you're right. Very good. Yeah, chuck in an Intel deep learning accelerator, and you're there. We're getting a bit technical. We <laughs> are. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'll stop talking. No, 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 and, no, uh, actually, keep it clean from now on. Yeah, it's quite important because the accessibility to on-edge hardware. Uh, I think that's one of the uh, weaknesses. Yeah. Uh, getting good access to that, especially if you have inference running on CPU, especially on Raspberry Pi, that's pretty amazing. That but um, a lot of projects are restricted by not being able to meet that inference time and then resorting to foreign hardware, which then has a number of issues. Oh, yeah, yeah. Trying to get stuff out of the US at the moment is, mm. is crazy. Do yeah. we do we have a problem with the word robotics in that the drone community don't feel a part of the robotics community because I get that sense in Australia. Really? Yeah. Um, well, just that I think this is probably one of the first meetings where there have actually been quite a few people, you know, who are interested in unmanned aerial systems. And, uh, you know, I think the comment about isn't it good to see, you know, drones as part of the robotics conversation. Um, you know, I think it's disappointing if if drones aren't considered part of the robotics conversation. But you know, occasionally people have commented, you know, about how in Australia at least how effectively we're engaging with the UAS community, and, I, and I'm not sure we we are. Um, but I'm also not sure whether part of the problem is that um, you know, just as we have an issue in here in Australia with uh, artificial intelligence, a lot of people thinking that robotics is just dumb hardware and not actually part of artificial yeah. intelligence. Whether yeah. we also uh, create barriers by using the term robotics without really thinking about it, because I know. Uh, you know, in my cyber physical systems research program, we have a lot of computer vision researchers and the first robotics roadmap was actually going to be called the robotics and computer vision roadmap. But I really thought that for the Australian public, that probably wouldn't make a lot of sense. 
but mm. none of my computer vision researchers have even glanced at it because they just don't think it's uh, relevant to them. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's surprising considering that so many people in, in New Zealand involved in computer vision uh, mm. are also involved in AI and also involved in robotics. Yep. You know, like, in fact, we even have our annual New Zealand Robotics Formation Sensing meeting at the computer, our annual computer vision conference. So uh, I, I see that it's very linked. I mean, you think of who did the, who's got on the autonomous car bandwagon first? It was a software yes. company. Google was Google Car. It wasn't a mechanical engineering company. So to me, this is a really important and large part of robotics, whether the robots are going along the surface of the land, flying in the air, moving under the water or on the boat. You know, these sort of four areas that we could say robotics encompasses in terms of translation, but, but we all have in common um, the visual systems and the navigation and so on. Well, I agree with you, but I, what I do like in New Zealand is that you include the word sensing. But I think that, you know, my observation would be that while robotics needs computer vision, computer vision researchers don't necessarily need robotics. And they don't necessarily feel part of the robotics community. Um, I'm not sure that there's an answer to that. I just, I wonder whether there is a way that we can use wording in some way or, or include some of those groups. Um, and that's why I just raised that question, you know, do people who see themselves as part of the UAS community not feel part of the robotics community and what we can do to change that. Well, you have a really wonderful annual computer vision conference. So if you sort of like trial what we have done and have the the annual meeting of, you know, the UAV, UAS community and the robotics community um, embedded in your annual computer vision community, then it's a way of bringing everyone together um, working on autonomous systems. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, the, we have a World of Drones Congress coming up in November, and yeah. it's now the World of Drones and Robotics, just to oh, be more sorry. explicit yeah. that it's yeah. inclusive. I think yeah. Catherine Ball always thought that it was inclusive, yeah. but people in the robotics, so, you know, uh, some people oh, on the, I guess, the uh, non-aerial robotics side didn't see it that way. Mm -hmm. I can understand that, yeah. Mm. But it's, it's one of the challenges um, in the roadmap and, and aligning the industry to, you know, educate the general public, including politicians, as to what robotics actually is and what it encompasses. I mean, the ABS system on your car um, is a robotic system. It has sensors, it has a processor, it has an actuator. You know, people get into elevators every day, it's robotics. Um, I think people are blissfully unaware of the degree robotics affects their lives. Yeah, I agree. And while we're speaking of threats, has there been any kickback from either government about uh, robotics taking away jobs at a time when there's high unemployment or we desperately need to employ people? I'm not sure we've had that conversation enough yet. Right. No, but it's, it underpins what I was saying before about the spelling of and being able to publicly say the word robotic is that there was that inherent um, understanding, I think, or interpretation and because we have heard, had it had conversations with people um, and actually there's some people on the call today that have actually had conversations with people um, explaining uh, when they've heard a reaction like, you know, but oh, those robots will take our jobs away. Um, and it's actually no, well, the, the, yes, there will, there will be displacement for sure, but um, it's globally shown that uh, robotics actually grows economic growth. Um, and you just have to look at the case study in Germany, um, the fact that the US was able to bring back some of its manufacturing thanks to robotics. Um, there's a whole heap of, of case studies out there. Um, but it's def the narrative is definitely there. It's uh, people's immediate thought is, oh, robots means less jobs. And so that's our task is to try and turn that around and, and make it um, robots actually means more jobs and stronger economic growth. So I think we need to uh, start our discussion on which opportunities are most relevant for Australia and New Zealand and, and you know, what initiatives we could uh, look at implementing. Um, we, Kent and I might have been a bit ambitious with the timing in that I think that we're maybe, um, we're st we still seem to be getting, generating a lot of interest. So I don't think everyone's had an opportunity to put up all their suggestions yet. So I think we'll leave the Miro board open and we might have to reconvene again. But in the time that we have remaining, 
uh, are there any opportunities that stand out to people of ways that Australia and New Zealand can can work to, together? I mean, Kent had already suggested some sort of Australasia testing facility, uh, some sort of international robotics competition with which has global participation so we can steal other people's talent. Oh, Kent didn't say that bit. Um, <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> uh, an Australasia industry support network. Um, I actually do think perhaps, you know, with the COVID situation, we could be doing a lot more to market ourselves as a destination for our talented expats. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely with the changes to the US visas as well. Yeah. The H1B visas. Yeah. So I reckon an initiative around that would be good, but exactly what that initiative would look like, I'm probably a little fuzzy. Yeah, it's definitely an issue um, based on just the people who are in my class um, are about 60% of them now work overseas. Um, so those are all people that studied robotics or automation, but now they don't work in New Zealand. Mm. Yeah. That also identifies potential threat for Australia and New Zealand with, with COVID-19 and the lack of access to technology and personnel from the US is it could be, uh, we could lose a year of um, development and um, advantage of integrating technology into our countries because we don't have access to it. Um, it can also be a huge advantage. I've noticed a, a lot more willingness for people to work remotely, um, you know, just from the last few months when people have been forced to work remotely. And if that mm -hmm. sticks, then that could mean that a lot more people could stay in Australia and New Zealand and, mm -hmm. you know, work for overseas companies. Um, yeah, so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hopeful that it might be on the uptick. <laughs> So, so, Sue, that might be, you know, a joint thing around or, or general category, and that is around a, a whether you call it a marketing program, um, but a joint program to, you know, um, upsell or not upsell, but just communicate the, what's going on, um, the the uh, and even you know showing and having potentially uh, a um, uh, an announcement around, uh, you know, Australia is working collab collaboratively with New Zealand to, you know, bring robotics, you know, uh, or I don't know the words now, but it, but essentially a marketing program that we could work work together that has that outward fo focused uh, communication, but also has the intent to try and attract some of those resources we were just talking about. So I think you know, that's, I wonder, that's a different one. I wonder if there's a, some way that we can track our alum a bit better because all the universities obviously have that, but would not necessarily share that information with us. But you know, the Australian Robotics and Automation Association has a has a newsletter. It's it's unclear to me what happens when people leave Australia, whether they keep those connections, um, and and whether there's a way that we can encourage people to keep those connections even if they do move overseas so that we can communicate that information with them or you know maybe we could just start a linkedin oz new zealand robotics group i think there's a few different options we could explore there that's that's a good idea that's yeah, a good idea. idea yeah i'm a graduate of sydney university to my undergrad and phd there and uh, yeah i've never had any connections um from alumni there about my topic yeah yeah yeah, I think that's a very good idea, Sue. And I think uh, we as a RAA will be able to start having a little bit like this, uh, especially because we have the mailing list as well. Yeah. We can track down yeah. a little bit. Um, so the other thing I think I want to bring up is that I know in uh, like the Europe or in and also in the US, they have this robotics seminar, uh, like uh, perhaps a monthly one during this COVID. And so, of course, it's in their time zone. Uh, so it's a bit difficult for people in Australia and New Zealand to actually join that. So perhaps one thing we can also do is establish something like that, because it's actually quite cheap now because no one needs to fly and things like that. So we can have an online presentation from robotics uh, here and then announce it in both Australia, New Zealand and even Asia, because our time zone are, are a little bit uh, near, right? That's easier for us to to listen to each other, to understand what people are doing, and also, uh, of course, announce it internationally to Europe, uh, US as well. If the time somehow fits, then they can also join, for instance. Yep. Yeah, no, that's a really good um, suggestion. 
Uh, we've been running um, almost monthly, uh, was bi-monthly um, cluster musters with Queensland Robotics, um, and they were well attended. And, and we did have quite a few international um, subscribers, especially during the, the COVID. So, so having a regular um, cadence, I think, would be really valuable. Yeah, I think we can we can try to set up something from the uh, and see how it goes. Uh, so I can I can talk to you further later, perhaps yeah. combine or something like that if you want to. Yep. What you can also see with the, the countries that are doing quite well with robotics is they all commonly have like a showcase of robotics, or like an annual event where they showcase industry to industry and the general public what's going on with robotics. Yeah, you see that in Japan and Singapore, they all show like have these large annual events where they show off what they can do, and I think it just encourages more industry usage of robotics as well. Which comes back to the point whether our respective PMs know what RAS stands for. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think so, that's um, just the opportunities there. Um, you know, we we had a, a thought the other day that we should initiate a um, new Australian New Zealand, the, the Tasman Challenge and, and hold a competition for um, solar vessels or autonomous vessels to go between you know, Brisbane, Auckland, one year <laughs> Auckland, the next one. Now, the media coverage of that would be, be very large. Um, or we'll even take it one step further and have a drone challenge between the two countries, but that might be a step too far at this stage. This is a redirect towards uh, an area where both countries can collaborate, like a targeted area. Um, both countries have uh, extremely large seafood harvesting industry. Mm. And um, uh, seafood That's harvesting tends to be uh, extremely uh, uh, labour intensive, uh, especially when you're talking about shellfish. You've got divers in the water for very, very long periods of time. Um, yeah. They're exposed to, to, to high risk. Um, and 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 in most cases, extreme, uh, extremely cold, uh, yeah. and the the harvest is is quite badly affected um, yeah, I, by I, weather I, events. Yeah, that's why we're um, doing so much work on autonomous drones because they're looking at having thousands of hectares of uh, mussel farms off the coast because we have a nice large shallow shelf, and uh, of course, then you need a lot more autonomous um, um, underwater support. And similarly, with our scallop beds, where we just rip up the ecology of the seabed instead of having that having automated um, systems sucking up the scallops off the seabed. So yeah, I agree. There's, there's so much opportunity there and it's a really good opportunity for expansion for both countries. We're, we're... The, our seabed industry is, is pretty much on par with regards to, to pricing. So there's not there's... really that, that price, price point um, uh, competitiveness between us. Yeah. Um, and uh, while we continually argue over who's got the best seafood, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, we, we can we can always let the consumer sort that one out for us. Yeah. Yeah. We've only missed the boat in salmon farming where the, where the Scandinavian countries have beat us there, but there's so many other opportunities that we're really good at. Absolutely. Just uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, but the interesting uh, aspect of the, not the competition uh, or the challenge between, but with uh, New Zealand and, and Australia. So you, you might have a joint mission trying to cross the Tasman Sea with a drone, for example. And this is to be done by two teams. Uh, I'm sure we could identify sources of um, support to, to enable that with companies that operate in both countries, maybe with government, but it might be a good thing to do. At least we'll inspire a little bit to what, what everyone is trying to achieve and building the capability uh, across across the ditch to, to have the, from both sides of the ditch, to, <laughs> to have the, the right capability in place to enable the economy to develop to the next level. So I think the key word here is collaboration. I think that's the big opportunity that we have ahead. Yeah. Okay, exactly. so we only have one more minute to wrap up. Um, so my understanding is we're going to leave the mirror board open. Kent, would you like to wrap up? Uh, yeah, thank you all for attending. Um, yeah, my understanding is we'll have the mirror board open for at least about probably a week, I guess. Um, so you can add any sort of kind of extra comments or things that come to your mind. Um, 
This has been a really productive workshop based on the number of post-it notes. Um, and yeah, I guess we, the Australia, oh, the, the NZRAS and the Australia Robotics Network will kind of discuss where we'll go from here. Um, and both to both of our roadmaps, we'll be adding a plan or an idea of where we should go forward with this collaboration. Yeah, and if anyone has some suggestions, I mean, we did tentatively talk about perhaps having a chapter on Australia-New Zealand collaboration. Um, might still be a bit early days, but I think there are some initiatives that we could start uh, looking at straight away. Yeah, so we just have to follow up on those. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Um, I'll release the recording of this, uh, you know, in a couple of days in case people were unable to join uh, and uh, look forward to seeing some more work on the mirror boards when, when you all have time. Thank you. Thanks. 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 All right. Thank you. Bye.